Welcome. I'm Pastor Craig Miller at First Alhambra Methodist. Today we're continuing our series on what the Bible has to say about heaven. We're going to be talking about the gateway. Let us open up with a word of prayer. Dear God, as we are mindful of our blessings, let us be a blessing to others. Amen. I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed doing this series about what the Bible has to say about heaven. And I didn't really realize how many different ways there were about thinking about heaven until uh, we got into this series. For example, we've talked about heaven as the Garden of Eden. Heaven as the household of God. Steps to heaven. Heaven as the kingdom of God. Heaven as paradise. And today, the gateway. Do you remember as a kid going to a theme park and how excited you were to get on the rides? But when you got to a particular ride, especially one of the roller coasters, which you really, really, really wanted to get on, there was a sign in front that said that you needed to be this tall to get on the ride and how disappointed you felt. It's interesting when we look around us how many different doors there are to either get in or to get out. There are doors in our houses, to our bedrooms and our bathrooms. Even inside a grocery store, there's doors to get to the food. Of course, there's the elevator doors. There's doors to get into our houses and Doors to get into our cars. So doors are all over the place. And if we think about it, we realize that they serve a couple of different purposes. One, they allow us to go into a particular place. They also help us to keep out people that we wouldn't want to come through that door. And it serves as a divider between what is inside and what is outside. So here's a sign that we didn't expect to see in such a great number. Sorry, we're closed. During the pandemic, this sign was all over the place. We couldn't go into restaurants. We couldn't go in to get our clothes dry cleaned. We weren't allowed to uh, go to ball games or to concerts. Um, we weren't even able to go to the doctor. We may have to go on our phone or our laptop to talk to our doctors. And if there was someone that we wanted to visit in the hospital, we weren't even able to do that. And of course, churches had these signs in front of them as well. Sorry, we are closed. And suddenly, the world that we had been living in became a lot smaller. You couldn't even get on an airplane if you wanted to go travel. Or if you did, it meant wearing a mask for an interminable number of hours <laughs> before you got off on the other side. Of course, we're still in the process of being closed. And we're even wondering that once things are open, are they really open or will it be just for a time. But what a relief it is when we actually go someplace that is now open. A couple weeks ago, Ivy and I went to Tui's. Now, if you remember, that restaurant was over on Atlantic and it got closed. And so it had been closed for over a year and a half and they relocated to South Pasadena. So we hadn't been in Tui's for a long time. Well, the other day we went over there and it's now open and we got to sit on the patio. And I think for the first time we actually sat down and had a meal outside of our house. 
it was a great experience. Suddenly it felt like things were somewhat getting back to normal. So we are very familiar with the idea of the gateway. And we're going to take a look at a couple of passages to help us think about what is the gateway and what Jesus was saying about it. John 10, verses 7 through 11 says, So again Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Well, let's look at four important concepts that comes out of this passage. First, Jesus is the gate. Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. So as we think about the different metaphors that we've been using for heaven, here's another one. The gate that leads to the pasture. And the pasture, of course, is a place of rest. We think of the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And that whole imagery that comes from that passage of rest that we get when we enter into God's pasture, into that heavenly place. And Jesus is saying there are a lot of gates out there. There are a lot of different choices that you can make. A lot of them lead to thieves and robbers who want to take everything from you. But I'm different. I'm the gate that leads to heaven. I'm the gate that leads to eternal life. So second, Jesus offers salvation. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Now that is a term that we haven't been using a lot lately in our culture, being saved. Now I remember as a young man and when I first started ministry, getting people saved was high on the priority list. The idea of being helping people find Jesus and getting their ticket checked into heaven. So this concept of being saved is something that we don't talk about very much, but it's still there, the idea that through Jesus we find salvation. We find life. And another part that's interesting in this particular part of the passage where it says, we'll come in and go out. Think about that. A a gate isn't very effective if it only allows you to go in one way. A gate becomes effective if you can go in and out of it. And I thought that was a very interesting. Now, I don't think Jesus is saying we're going in and out of heaven, but I think it says to us that in our daily lives, we make choices that leads us to times of rest and reflection, communion with God, and we make choices that lead us to other things, distress, anger, frustration. But we have that choice to go through this gate that is Jesus. But when we go in, we find pasture. Number three, through Jesus we find abundance. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So abundance is another loaded term. What are we really talking about? Does it mean that we will have all material wealth? We'll have all the cars that we want and the houses and we will have everything that will give us comfort? Is that what Jesus means by abundance? I think what he's saying here, 
that your life will be abundant. It will bear fruit. Remember that Jesus lived in a society of farmers. And so a lot of the things he was talking about had to do with the farming world. And here we see some images of grapes in the background of this slide. And he's talking about an abundant crop. That your life will be abundant. That you will bear good fruit. Fruit that lasts forever. I think one thing that can happen to us is that we get into a scarcity mindset. We're afraid to make decisions or to do things because we think there won't be enough. That we won't be provided the things that we need to go forward. So we want to hold on to things. We almost want to hoard the things that we have. Instead of living with a mindset of abundance. Believing that everything that we need will be provided in its time. That God's blessings will surround our lives. As we receive the gifts of God. And the abundance that we are looking for is not material things but the abundance of love and joy and happiness and great relationships with people and being involved in the lives of those around us. That's the abundance that Jesus is talking about, the abundant life. And number four, Jesus sacrificed for us. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And here Jesus is talking about how the shepherd's responsibility is to watch out for the flock, to guard the flock from danger and to keep it safe. Now, this last week, I don't know if you saw the video of a 17-year-old teenage girl who was in her backyard with her dogs when suddenly there was a bear on top of the fence walking across, and the dogs started barking at the bear. And the bear looked at the dogs and started swiping at the dogs, and the girl ran up to the bear and pushed it off the fence, grabbed the dogs, and ran into her house. Well, she was laying down her life. She was willing to do so for her dogs. Now, afterwards, she said, I don't know why I did that. It was really a crazy thing to do. But in the moment, it was the only thing I could think of to do to save my dogs. And luckily, she was safe and the bear went the other way. The good shepherd defends his flock, and is willing to lay down his life as Jesus did for the flock that is his. Now the next passage we're going to look at looks at sheep and goats. And if you think about it, sheep and goats have different ways of looking at the world. Sheep are are grazers. They love to get into an open field and just calmly eat the grass that is before them. And they are followers. They like to huddle together and stay together and move as one big unit across the field. Where goats, goats are a different animal. They are browsers. They will eat anything that is in front of them. I remember one time I was with my son at the zoo and we were in the petting zoo and I was holding the program which had the map of the zoo and I had it in my back pocket and suddenly I could hear something going on. I heard some some chewing and I looked back and, and there was a goat eating up my map. Goats are curious. They don't like to stay in one place. They are independent. 
They like to do their own thing. So with those two images in mind, let us look at this passage. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. So you see, at the beginning of this passage in Matthew 25, how Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. So that's a very interesting metaphor. We already talked about the difference between sheep and goats. How the sheep are willing to follow Jesus. And it says here that they are blessed and they will inherit the kingdom of God. So the passage continues. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer him, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. So here Jesus, as he is addressing the crowd, makes a profound statement. The way you treat others is how you are treating me. The way you treat those who are in need or in prison or hungry or sick reflects upon how you are responding to me as well. And I think the message that he is saying to us is that heaven is not just something that we're to wait for, but we are to live as if we are in the kingdom of God now. We are to act like we are part of God's kingdom and respond accordingly treating others as God has treated us. But Jesus isn't finished. He has something else to say. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and he gave me no food. I was thirsty and he gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So these strong words from Jesus should give us pause. Notice how he says to the goats, you know, when you saw someone in need, and you ignored them, you were ignoring me. When you did not help someone who was sick or hurting or ignored their pleas, you were ignoring me. And you're 
result of that will be the reward that you will get. The eternal fires where the devil will be. Where if you treat those as you are treating yourself with love and kindness, then you will have eternal life. The difference between these two couldn't be more clearly detailed to us. It's very clear what Jesus is saying. So it says to us there is another sign we should be looking for and offering. It goes beyond being just open or closed. The sign is welcome. Are people welcomed here? I remember back in the time of Katrina, how many different groups went to uh, help out. But the one group that really got a lot of positive remarks was the United Methodist Committee on Relief. The reason why is, is that when the Committee on United Methodist Relief, UMCOR, arrives in a disaster zone, they just don't show up for a week or two and give out supplies to people. They are there for the long haul. They stay there to help put systems in place to help sustain people for the long term beyond just the short term issue that they were facing. So New Orleans during the Katrina, the recovery time that took many years, Encore was there to serve. And it was a great witness to people in the community of the power of that particular organization to help people, not just for a minute, but for a long time. So think about your life. Are you a sheep or are you a goat? (laughs) Or are you somewhere in between? Jesus calls us to listen to his voice, to come to the gate and let it be open to us and go in the pasture. But he says, don't come alone. Bring those around you, with you. Invite them to know of my love and grace as well. So they too may be welcomed into this heavenly place. Well, the reality is that as individuals and as a faith community, we have a long ways to go when it comes to living up to the demands of these passages. It reminds us that we are called to serve in the name of Jesus wherever we are, however we are able to do, but to do so with a spirit of abundance, that there is enough for everyone, for God has truly blessed us, and that we are to throw down the welcome mat wherever we are, to embrace those around us, just as Jesus embraces us today. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before we hear our hymn today, let us receive this benediction. Dear God, give us the desire to focus on the gifts that come from heaven. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, grace, and compassion. Amen.